Great. We should, um, we'll do some quick introductions and then we'll um, get started on, on um, the main the main webinar. Um, so lovely to meet you all. Um, my name is Edith. I am a manager at Fresh Minds. Um, I have been at the company for, for five years now and I look after the more senior experienced higher end of our permanent department. Um, and lovely to have you all uh, here with us today. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Alex. Uh, I sit on the same team as Edith at Fresh Minds. I've been here for about five and a half years, um, and I look after the graduate and other careers um, and of um, our and the pool, um, and also run some of our summer internship programs. Great. So for, for those of you who are um, not familiar with Fresh Minds, just as a, a quick overview of, of where we sit in the market, um, we're a small boutique um, firm. We've been around for about 22 years this year, and we specialise in placing people with the consulting toolkit. Um, so what that means in our world really is, is we focus on um, candidates and remits that have uh, elements of analytical rigor, financial acumen, commercial acumen, and a strategic overlay, and really that balance between um, IQ and EQ and, and being able to make an impact within um, a, a role within an organization. Uh, the business internally is split into to three different pillars. Um, so we've got our permanent team, which is where Alex and I sit, um, which is, yes, you're very much kind of traditional recruitment model where we place everything from, from interns, graduates, right up to, to um, more executive level placements and, and really everything in between of that. Um, we also have a flexible interim business who place the same type of candidates, but on short or longer term contract opportunities. Um, and again, cover, cover the range of experiences there and, and the projects can vary in length from a week right up to kind of a year in, in length. And then the third pillar to our business is our, our managed projects offering, um, which essentially combines our in-house um, network of candidates and places them on, on projects where um, it's completely outsourced to Fresh Minds to deliver that end to end. Um, our our ethos and our business model is very much focused on long term partnerships and we love to build that relationship with candidates, you know, very much from graduate level right up to seeing them through their, their full spectrum of career, both, um, you know, flipping from, from candidate and, and client perspective. Um, and yeah, just as an example of, I guess, the, the areas in which we work. Um, as you can see from, from the screen, we work with some of the, the largest consulting firms, um, but also more uh, boutique firms as well that have a sector or functional specialism. We work with in, um, boutique investment banks and corporate finance boutiques, um, private equity, and then you've got your, your well-known corporates as well as fast-growing scale-ups um, where we, we place candidates into as well. So in terms of the, um, the agenda for today, um, we are going to run through where does it, where do you all begin, where, how to approach the job search from, from the initial stages, best kind of our hints and tips for structuring a, a CV that will stand out, some more practical hands-on interview tips in terms of getting ready for, um, for that phase, and then more kind of broader themes on, on hiring trends and, and networking. And then of course, at the end, we'll have um, uh, any questions that you've got, just fire them into the, the chat box and we'll we'll come around to answering as many of them as possible in the time in time given. So yes, I'll um I'll hand over to Alex uh, to chat you through the, the first uh, first phase of yeah, where where does where do you begin? Great. Thanks very much for the introduction, Edith. Um so approaching your job search, um, as maybe many of you have I've realized is almost like a full-time job in itself. Um, it is um, a process that you need to structure very clearly. Um, and you need to definitely have a bit of a strategy when you start off. Um, and the way in which we've chosen to um, talk about it today is uh, in sort of two um, possible scenarios. One is that you're looking to start your career. Maybe you're due to graduate from university soon or or you've left and, and you're looking for that first full-time role, or maybe you are in a role currently, but you're just looking to make a change. Um, so uh, I suppose just in terms of 
um, the general mindset that you should have, no matter which of these two scenarios you're in, um, you just need to reflect very carefully on the things that you're the most passionate about, the things that you get a lot of energy and motivation from, um, and maybe even mapping out some long-term goals, which doesn't necessarily need to be as rigid as you know, a three to five year plan or, or anything like that. But if you have certain professional aspirations for the future, then it's just worth kind of looking at how you're going to get there and mapping out some clear and, and structured steps. Um, so if you are uh, in a role currently, um, and you're looking to either switch careers or just move into a slightly different environment or just take on a new challenge. Um, you just need to first kind of identify why is it that you're looking for something else? Is it because um, perhaps you've plateaued and there aren't any more opportunities to, to progress in your career in your current company? Is it because a big project has just come to an end and you're just looking for, for a new challenge? Are you looking for just a bit of a change of scenery if you've been in the same place for a while? Um, have there been any kind of massive changes happening at the company? Has it been through uh, an acquisition perhaps that's massively changed the culture and, and some of its strategic objectives? So really just being able to pinpoint all of these questions will not only help you to direct your energy in the best way when you're looking for a role, but it also helps when you're in an interview process with a potential new employer, you have to explain your current situation, your thought process behind looking for something new. Um, it's also really important to map out what your current skill set is. So are you perhaps very good at financial modeling and valuation? Uh, are you very good at the operational side of things? Uh, are you um, someone who has experience in large transformation and change projects? Um, whatever that may be, you just need to make sure that you're very, very clear on the specific skills that will allow you to add value in your next role. Um, and I suppose there are some instances where maybe you know that you want to change, but you're just not quite sure what your skill set could transfer across to in terms of your next move, in which case it's really useful to reach out to a recruiter, reach out to a headhunter, and just get their view on where someone with your type of experience could potentially transition. Um, if you're a little bit stuck, then it can often help to kind of push things along just to get someone else's perspective and a general perspective on what the market is looking for as well, um, because there might be some areas where you need to upscale or just spend a little bit more time preparing to get the roles that you really want. Um, if you're just starting your career, um, it's, um, again, either going to be a case of you have an idea of what you want to do, um, you know that there are certain industries or types of companies that you're really excited about, um, maybe you're not quite sure about what function you want to be working in, whether it's strategy or operations or uh, M&A advisory or whatever else, um, or you might just not really have uh, a very clear idea at all of what you want to do, but you still want to build up that commercial experience. In the latter scenario, there are some um, safe options, we can call them, to ensure that your career is off to a good start and just setting a foundation of transferable skills and that there will be good exit opportunities maybe two, three years after um, that first role. So generally speaking, um, looking at some of the uh, graduate schemes that are available, um, with large corporates, with large consultancies, that could be a good option. Um, looking at uh, potentially starting your career in something like M&A advisory or corporate finance advisory more broadly can also be a good point for someone that wants to maintain that combination of analytical skills, commercial thinking and stakeholder interaction. And it leads to loads of other options further along the way. So essentially what you want to do if you're at the starting point and you're just feeling a bit clueless as, as to where to start, um, you want to pick something that will open more doors further down the line than it will close. Um, I'll leave Edith to, to tell you more about how to avoid job search fatigue since it's like a full-time job in itself. 
Yes, absolutely. Um, so yes, whether you're in a role or, or not, job searching can, can be very tiring and can be very draining. And um, you need to make sure that, yeah, you're looking after your own um, mental well-being as well as, you know, putting in the, the right level of investment um, for, for your future career. Um, so good ways of doing that is very much kind of treating it a little bit like, you know, a part of your day or a part of your, your job role, setting aside an hour, two hours, maybe you like doing that as a particular time of the day where you feel more kind of productive productive um, or in the evenings, mornings, um, whatever it might be that suits you, but really dedicating that time to, um, to make a plan and, and um, target your, your job search um, from the offset. Um, there's some great um, there's some great books out there and resources. Um, there's a lot of online personality behavioral tests that you might in interact with, you know, through the interview process. But if it's more kind of at the beginning stages that you want to kind of get to know yourself and your strengths and um, you know the type of environments that you're going to thrive in, um, there's a lot of resources online that, that generally are free. And the Myers Briggs test and um, all those kind of different personality psychological tests can be really really helpful. Um, um, and there's a lot of published books, which we'll, we'll send around the names um, within an article at the end of the, the webinar. But um, there's, some, there, there's some really good ones. One that's more kind of a practical guide um, for every stage of the process is a, a book called What Colour Is Your Parachute? Um, which really kind of gets you thinking about um, your skills and what gives you energy and then um, helps you kind of all the way along, along your career uh, and job search journey. Um, there's another book called Pivot, um, which is, is really good in terms of if you want actually a, a quite a strong kind of career change um, from what you've been doing before. Um, and then there's various other ones that are more uh, focused on technology or upskilling and, and that sort of thing. Um, I'd say avoiding the kind of scatter gun approach for LinkedIn ads, obviously, you know, with um, the easy apply button on LinkedIn, it's fantastic. And you can be really efficient in terms of applying for a mass volume of jobs, um, which can can have its benefits, of course. Um, but if there's a job that you come across that you think is just your absolute dream job, sounds like the fantastic company that you want to be working in, and you really feel like you tick kind of all the boxes, um, finding someone that's relevant within that company that's maybe the hiring manager or looking at your connections, maybe someone that can give you an introduction, that can really kind of pay dividends in the long run um, in terms of targeting um, the, the best job search. But I would caveat that with you don't want to do that for 10, 15 jobs, um, but, you know, just if the right one comes along that you think it is really kind of your skills in the same way, you know, reaching directly out to a recruiter um, that's looking after it can also be helpful to understand whether you are the right fit. If you're not, you know, what is it about it that, that's not ticking just to kind of get more clarity in your mind about that transferable skill set that Alex was, was talking about. Um, there's also some, um, you can set up kind of job board notifications, which will help kind of more on the reactive side um, to yeah, looking at um, if you I want to be notified of every strategy manager job that comes in, that, um, that's really helpful on that front. And then there's also kind of um, keyword and aggregated platforms um, where they can use kind of tailored searches um, using keywords that you want to find in your job adverts um, and places like Google for jobs um, where they'll just show every single strategy manager job that um, is, is relevant within a particular kind of geographical area or, or um, you know, uh, in terms of a particular sector and therefore um, you don't have to kind of keep scrolling throughout them but it gives you that something that you can check in on on a weekly basis for example um so yes hopefully that that helps um but yeah i think the key thing there is is knowing when to take a break if you've ha if you've been looking at it for you know two to three weeks and um you know particularly in the market that is as competitive as it is at the moment it is important to to take breaks to um yeah refresh reset Kind of think about things talk to your network talk to recruiters um and then come back to it when you're feeling like you've got the energy to do so um and yeah you'll you'll find that as a, a an easier kind of targeted approach um so next we're going to move on to structuring your your cv and some of our tips from um from obviously i've done this for, for a few times of, of what really stands out in, in a cv Great, fantastic. Um, so there isn't necessarily a, um, 
an ideal formula for this, but there are some principles that if you respect them, um, it will make it easier for recruiters and employers to understand your experience. And it's just quite a clean, consistent way of, of structuring that. Um, so we'll um, sort of run through two versions, one for um, candidates who are in their early, early, um, the early stages of their job search or recent graduates, and then one for, for more experienced hires. Um, there are obviously some variations of how you can lay out your experience depending on the industry, the specific type of role that you're going for. Uh, there are even different expectations um, across different geographies. So for instance, a standard European CV will look a little bit different to, to the CVs that we see in the UK. Um, but yeah, we'll move on to the, the two kind of different versions, obviously emphasizing that these are um, CVs which are suitable for most commercial roles. And um, if you're doing something that's a little bit different, like applying for um, a programmer position or applying for a creative industry, then you can obviously stray from, from the type of format that we're recommending here. Um, so as a graduate, um, this is a, a pretty kind of uh, fail-proof way of formatting your, your CV. You want to make sure that your education is at the top um, with your grades laid out clearly. Um, if you haven't done A-levels, then obviously try to include the equivalent qualification and, and what you got there. Because you're still in the very early stages of, of your career and your search employers still value that quite a lot and, and it's a point of differentiation for candidates. Um, so make sure that you, you lay that out um, very clearly. And then the same for your uh, university degree. Um, there isn't a need to um, list uh, all of your modules, but if you feel that there are some which would be particularly relevant to the roles that you're applying to, um, then do go ahead and, and make sure to emphasize them as well as potentially your, your dissertation or, or your thesis subject. Um, it can be quite eye-catching if it relates to the, the position that you're applying to. Um, when you are listing your work experience, you want to make sure that it's in reverse chronological order, so to most recent to, to oldest. And you want to make sure that you're keeping things that are as relevant as possible. So if you've done um, open days with various different companies, for instance, um, if you're applying to uh, an investment banking internship and you've attended a series of open days with, with different banks. It's not necessary to list them under experience because they're just inside days as opposed to a situation where you are actually given a piece of work that is reflective of the day to day in that role. So I would avoid listing those um, those types of open days under work experience and I would just stick to uh, more solid internships that you've done. Uh, potentially even positions of responsibility that you held during university if they've equipped you with useful transferable skills. Um, the way in which you want to talk about your experience as well is uh, in bullet points, avoiding big blocks of text because when most employers or recruiters initially look at your CV, they, they do scan through it. So it's just not particularly um, eye-catching if it's just a massive block of text. So you want to highlight achievements in the roles you held, you want to highlight um, quantifiable achievements, ideally. So, for instance, if you've worked on a project that has um, helped to save the company a certain amount of money, you want to make sure that you list those numbers in there because um, they just help to provide a measure of how successful you were in that role. Um, and then at the bottom, you want to have a section where you either list extracurricular activities or volunteering experience um, or technical skills, language skills. Um, and with technical skills, it's becoming increasingly important that you have at least a solid grasp of Excel and PowerPoint across most industries that we work in at least. Um, that tends to be the minimum standard in terms of technical skills. But then there are also other tools that um, will vary depending on the role, but if you know how to use SQL, for instance, or you've done a bit of programming in Python, then make sure to list that and uh, try to give uh, an idea of how proficient you are with that tool. Um, 
If you are a more experienced candidate, then the order in which you list things changes slightly. So you'll want to have your work experience at the top, followed by education, and then additional information or um, additional skills at the bottom. Um, the career overview paragraphs is something that we'd recommend you avoid if you're a recent graduate, just because it tends to not add a huge amount of value. And what happens a lot of the time is, is going to be tailored to a specific role, but then you end up applying to something else that has caught your eye and it just becomes quite an awkward situation if you said you're interested in economic analyst positions while applying to strategy consulting roles, for instance. So you want to avoid that if you're more junior. Uh, if you are more experienced, it can serve as a really useful snapshot of your career to date, um, your uh, kind of core experience as a professional, and potentially maybe even listing a bit about your long-term aspirations, although don't feel like you have to do that. Try to use this paragraph more to just give a summary of your experience and the skills that help you to really stand out. Um, same with the projects that you've worked on, achievements that you've had, you, you just want to make sure that you talk about them in a really precise way, quantifying things wherever possible. Um, so hopefully that helps just to kind of give you some basic pointers on how to structure your CV. Um, there are variations, as we mentioned earlier, but um, I think these are, these are some kind of core guidelines to start off with. Right. right. Um, thank you. So, you know, next we're going to talk about the, the transferable skill set, which at Fresh Minds we, we very much um, yeah, place a big emphasis on. And it's really important to understand your transferable skill set when you approach um, the, the job search. Um, so depending on your kind of target job search areas, once you've kind of worked through your skills and your motivations and drivers, um, I'd advise maybe having kind of two or three different or adaptable versions of your CV. Um, and I guess you can, uh, there's a few ways of using that, that editing tool. So if you, for example, are um, a healthcare professional that has specialized in, in operations throughout their career, um, and you really want to move into another healthcare organization, but you want to step away from operations or move into more of a generalist um, type position, um, what you do is, is beef up the, the healthcare focus that you've had, or if you're a general, generalist wanting to step into healthcare, you know, place a lot of emphasis on that sector, um, sector that you've got experience in. Flip side is that if you um, really want to uh, broaden out from healthcare, but you really enjoy the operational aspect, and you utilize that functional experience that you've gained in order to move into more of a, um, a different sector or a more generalist role in terms of sector. So I guess the two, two ways of looking at it is that you, you probably have a, a sector a function, a sector focus and a functional focus, and it's choosing which one is going to be more relevant to the career move that you want to make and adapting your CV to, um, to highlight and emphasize whichever one um, is going to be more relevant to your career moving forward. Um, the, the other thing is um, extracting kind of keywords from the job advert and responsibilities. And there's a there's an article that we'll, we'll send around as well that, that highlights some of the jargon that really is um, quite hard to navigate sometimes. And, and I'm not saying that you need to implement that, that jargon into your CV, but certainly being familiar with the words that um, companies use and kind of um, yeah, understanding what that means for, for your experience and being able to translate that across um, articulately in, in an interview or, or CV um, setting. Um, and um, yeah, make sure that uh, you you know which ones that you will need upskilling on. You know, for example, um, if Alex said, you know, you're you're really good at Excel, but you perhaps want to go into more of a, a programming role, but you you're not necessarily familiar with Python or R or something like that. Don't be afraid to um, to say that you'll need upskilling in that. It's it's not uncommon, really, at any stage of your career, that you're not going to hit five out of five boxes on on the job spec, and a lot of it will come down to the culture fit and the motivations for joining, as well as the the hard skills. But the softer skills are are equally as important. Um, and if you walk into an interview setting, being very self aware um, about what 
progression learning development you're going to need from the company I think it, it shows a real kind of drive for learning um, and uh, development and being able to want to stay at a company and, and progress within that culture um, because there always will be a priority there will always be some non-negotiables for for the role that's that's being uh, that's easy to say but there'll also be some um, more desirable or um, yeah other qualities that, that you can bring um, that outweigh that um, and yeah make sure sorry uh, the last thing on that just in terms of kind of researching the company um yeah we can talk about more of this in the, the interviewing skills but um yeah understanding more about where they sit in the market having some really kind of good questions in mind to answer in the interview um would be is is really where you kind of shine uh, in that side um so yes in terms of kind of um approaching the interview you've done the, the CV, you've, uh, you've landed the interview, what can you do to really kind of stand out, stand out from the crowd? Um, so we segmented this into kind of three key areas. I'll cover off the, the first two and then um, Alex will we'll talk more around the third. Um, but yes, in terms of that, that latter point on, on research and preparation, um, get to know your CV really well, whichever kind of version you're, you're using and, and the transferable skill sets that you want to focus on. Um, be really clear in your mind about um, the, the expertise that you bring. Um, and research the company thoroughly, understand how that translates over to their sector or their focus or their values and their, their mission driven, if they're more of a kind of uh, ESG or sustainable type of why that matters to you in, in, your, in your life and where you want to be in your career. Um, and tailor your motivations, you know, obviously don't lie, but tailor your motivations in your, the clubs that you've done at university and the, the groups that you've perhaps been in um, and any extracurriculars that you obviously do as well that, that translate into the company is, is good to speak about. Um, and I guess uh, a, a good question um, that sometimes comes up in interviews that can sometimes throw people off um, is more about the macro trends of what's happening in, in ESG or hydrogen or, um, you know, what, whatever it might be in terms of sector. Have an opinion and, um, you know, don't be afraid to, to show that opinion. I think it's people... Um, uh, warm to people that, that you know have researched thoroughly they have kind of a an educated guess or you know they can put their hands up and say I, I don't know too much about it but here's my take and um, so yeah have have some kind of good questions in mind about you know if if this happens in the current economy what does that mean for your business and um, that will really show that you've you've done your research and thought about it uh, quite thoroughly um, and obviously, you know, in the, the uh, model that we're in at the moment, it won't be unusual that um, maybe all of your interview process or at least some of it will be done via um, video interview. Um, so just make sure that you're really comfortable using uh, Zoom or MS Teams or Google Meets or whatever uh, the platform that they might be. If you're not familiar with it and you've never used it, do have a trial run before you go into the interview because sometimes it can be unfamiliar and really it's not too much of a hassle to switch onto another platform if it's something that your laptop can't download or you know you don't want to be kind of faffing around it at the last stages when you log on to the meeting. So yeah, make sure that you've kind of done a, a dry run of, of whichever platform they use. Um, obviously it goes without saying, yeah, check, check your Wi-Fi. I know it's not always, always foolproof, but yeah, go to a spot where you know that the Wi-Fi is good beside the router or, or just make sure that you're in a, a good space that it's not going to drop out. Um, my, my Wi-Fi will probably drop out after this. Um, make sure you're in a quiet area, you know, you've uh, yeah, put all your kind of notifications on do not disturb your phone and um, make sure that the people that you're living with or um, you know, where, wherever you might be is uh, you're, you're in peace and you're not going to be disturbed. Um, one that is, is quite difficult uh, to, to get right sometimes is addressing professionally because I think over COVID particularly everyone's become a lot more dressed down really in, in their approach but our rule of thumb is that you always want to look as smart if not one kind of step smarter than the, the interviewer so understanding a bit about um, the company culture you know having a look at the team and the way that they're dressed on the website their LinkedIn profiles will give you a really good sense of okay well that's probably how they dress in the office if it's t-shirt and jeans then just go one smarter and go kind of um smart casual don't go kind of full suit and tie but you know you can you can kind of mirror your appearance appearance based on what them but you don't want to go too casual really for for any interview stage um and yeah it is really hard to kind of get that chemistry and and um rapport built over over zoom that's not um that's not unusual um but i guess the the best thing you can do is is you know keep eye contact as much as possible smile 
keep engaged, be enthusiastic. And you, you do probably need to put in a little bit more effort than you would in person because, you know, that um, your personality radiates when you're in person and it's just harder to have that barrier. So um, that extra turning up the notch of, of, of charm over, over Zoom um, is, is probably um, won't, uh, won't be a bad thing. Um, yes. Great. In terms of some of the questions that you might be asked, um, you will probably be asked uh, competency questions which help you to showcase specific skills and experiences that you've had, as well as maybe your um, attitude to certain situations or, or certain workplace challenges. So one of the methods that is really widely recommended, no matter what level you're interviewing at, is the STAR method, um, which uh, I think we can also send some resources about after the webinar. Um, but it essentially allows you to just structure your answer very clearly in terms of the specific scenario that you were dealing with um, or the situation, um, the sort of task that you had to undergo in, in that scenario or, or the sort of specific actions that you embedded in order to overcome that challenge or, or solve that problem. Um, and then it helps you to also very clearly state the conclusion, the outcome of that situation, uh, as well as your learnings from it. Uh, that's probably the only other thing that I would add on to the traditional STAR method, that it mostly focuses on helping you to describe a situation in very clear steps, but there isn't necessarily an element of it that involves um, highlighting the specific learnings. So I would just add that onto the tail of it um, so that you can demonstrate that you are reflective, you have the ability to just think back on how you approach to certain situations, and maybe even think of some improvements or, or things that you could have done differently. Um, in terms of um, some of the questions that you can ask in an interview, again, they can really help you to not only stand out, but continue to build that understanding of what this company is about, because interviewing is very much a two-way process. It's not just you kind of going out there and, and presenting yourself and your motivation. It's also trying you trying to find out whether this is the right company and the right role for you. So in terms of the questions that you ask, you, you want to make sure that firstly, you ask things that you're genuinely interested in receiving the answer to, um, as opposed to something generic that just is a filler question because you know that the interviewer probably expects you to ask one or two things at the end. So you can ask about things like, the long-term progression of the role that you're applying to. You can ask about the firm's um, strategic plans for the next two, three years or longer. You can ask about maybe a certain product or a new type of service that they're, they're developing currently and haven't launched yet. You can ask about the culture or the team dynamic. Um, I'd probably avoid more practical questions that you can quite easily find the answer to on their website uh, or maybe through uh, just a quick follow-up chat after. So depending on the level of stakeholder that you're interviewing with, if you're, um, say, interviewing with the MD or the head of one of the, the divisions of this company, you want to really just take advantage of that opportunity to ask some insightful things that you'll get a valuable response to. Um, so we've listed some examples on, on the slide, but you can obviously expand on those points. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the key hiring trends that have come out of the past few months. Um, obviously, this is a fairly focused version of, of what's happening in the market currently. There, there are loads more um, quite interesting movements to, to keep an eye out for in the next few months, but one of them is uh, obviously the, the continued demand for tech skills, which is pretty uniform across all industries that we operate in at least. Um, so you need to have uh, not necessarily programming skills as such, but you need to have at least a good level of awareness of what are the main tools or the main platforms that are being used in the industry at which you're planning on moving into or what does the company that you're applying to specifically use if that type of information is available, which sometimes it's not, um, but it just helps to, to have done that background research and just have a basic level of understanding of those tools and what they're used for in a commercial setting. Um, if you are applying for a role that has a data analysis component, um, to it, then it's quite valuable to maybe look up some online courses if you haven't had the chance to directly 
apply those skills either in your degree or in your prior work experience. Um, the internet is full of free tools that you can use to upskill, um, loads of tutorials that you can dive into. So um, we definitely recommend that you have a look at things like SQL, Excel macros, VBA, um, and then maybe particular programming tools depending on the specific roles that you're interested in. Um, ESG and sustainability uh, is particularly exciting in the investment and financial services space. Um, so if you're applying for anything in that general area, it's just so important to have an understanding of why this movement has taken place, what are the driving factors behind it, which are fairly self-explanatory, but you want to understand it from a commercial lens as well. Um, and as Edith was saying earlier, you want to make sure that you have a viewpoint on these themes and you've done a bit of background reading. Um, again, you, you won't be short of resources here. There are plenty of books available on these topics, articles, talks, and so on. Um, so do make sure that you have an awareness of, of those themes. Um, and then from um, it's a slightly more, more practical perspective, um, remote interviewing uh, and kind of remote onboarding and all these things, they're not really going to go away anytime soon, um, which is great because it allows for so much flexibility and, and accommodating everyone's different kind of personal situations when, when interviewing, but you just want to get fully comfortable with that setting. Um, you want to make sure that you know, you're, you're still bringing across that same level of enthusiasm um, and motivation as you would in real life interactions. So just get get comfortable with the remote setting. Uh, we're obviously in a hybrid phase now where we're meeting in person as well as online, but you just want to make sure that you're not kind of falling behind and, and you're still showcasing yourself in the best light possible. And I think to that point, um, you know, where we see where we see kind of the normal processes playing out is that perhaps kind of one or two rounds of interviews might be done online but I would encourage that if you've got any doubts about the company or you just think it would help to meet in person don't be afraid to ask um because you know to to both Alex and I's points you know online is is great to some extent but you really really get a much better feel for the culture the office you know what the interactions are like day to day if you just go and meet and it doesn't need to be a formal interview round you could have already kind of received an offer but just ask if you can kind of pop in for a coffee chat and employers will typically be, be more than happy to accommodate you know um 45 minutes you get to meet some of the team that you'd be working with and it really just does give you a, a much kind of fuller picture of what it would be like to work there and from the feedback that we've kind of had and obviously you know people that we interview as well um it does it does help so don't be afraid to ask the question if you do want to to just go and meet some people face to face for a coffee um as i say it doesn't need to be anything formal but can really help um help you decide particularly if you've got kind of a few offers on the table um so yes in terms of kind of networking and and maybe kind of the the softer things and and the subconscious things that you can kind of do in the background um just to help you kind of stay ahead of, of the job search really helpful to stay in touch with ex-colleagues bosses impressive people that you've met along um your career path people from university um and obviously you don't need to to keep in touch and go for coffees all the time but um it's good to network add people on linkedin make sure that you're kind of staying up to date with what they're doing because you never know kind of might not be something immediate right now but in five years time ten years time they could be you know your future employers or, or colleagues so always good to to keep that as, as front and center in terms of linkedin or whatever other tools you use to to network um Talk to recruitment firms and um, just make sure I think um, it is important to make sure that your CV and your, your candidate rights are, are respected. Your CV is not passed along to firms without your permission. You um, have a level of trust and rapport with them that, you know, they are, they're going to be able to guide you through an interview process. They'll be able to kind of flag relevant jobs and you, you, you hopefully will be able to tell kind of the, the transactional recruiters versus the, the ones that are a little bit more rigorous in, in their approach. Um, so yeah, just just be wary of, of that and make sure that um, yeah your, your your CV and your your rights are being respected. Um, obviously, it's a little bit different now, and and you know not the same as being in a room full of fifty to hundred people. But look out for networking opportunities as you've all done now. Events, webinars can be really helpful both for um, self knowledge and building up um, yeah different parts of uh, your skill set and and you know uh, yeah 
events and, and interests that you have, um, but also just in terms of kind of um, putting yourself out there and, and meeting people kind of along along the way. Um, and yes, I've kind of gone over that in terms of uh, building a relationship with a recruiter. You want to kind of get their their honest feedback. You want to be them to be able to tell you what really is going to be the most feasible path that you can go down and help you get there with their hints and tips. Um, rather than just either say say yes to everything or, or not kind of give you the time of day if you're not right for, for them. Um, so yes, I think that's us um, done with our content. So we've had a, a few questions kind of come through um, on, the, um, on the chat. Um, so I'll start with the first one. So um, someone's asked in terms of when you respond to LinkedIn opportunity or a job advert there um, and you put your CV forward, what's the normal time scale to nudge someone um, if you've not had feedback um, and you've not heard anything back? Um, so I guess there's a couple of things to consider here. Um, if it's through a recruitment agency, um, I don't think there's absolutely any harm in messaging them directly with your CV and just saying to them, as a heads up, I've um, applied for this role, think it'd be a really good fit, like have you got time to chat, or if I'm not right, be good to kind of understand why. And most recruiters will take the time to, to come back to you. Um, they might say, look, we've been inundated with applications, give us a week and we'll come back. Um, if it's to a job posting directly, I'd probably leave it somewhere between kind of three and five days um, and then follow up after that just gives them the time to run through the applications but I would also be be conscious that if there is kind of 200 300 job posts like um, people that have applied for the same job you, you might not be able to get kind of direct feedback but hopefully if there's you know between 10 and 50 applications for the the role you, you'll be able to follow up but yeah I'd say between three and five days is, is an optimum time to um, for for it to nudge and, and not be a, a pain to them. Great. So another quite good question that's come through uh, related to LinkedIn still is how can you make sure that your profile is found by recruiters and you get contacted with suitable opportunities, which LinkedIn is a great tool, but there are obviously some back-end uh, elements to it, or not back-end, but a side of it that recruiters can see, which you need to be aware of that you need to kind of leverage the different filters that you're allowed to fill in in order to come up in different searches in order to indicate that you are open to different opportunities so one of the key things that you can do is you can mark yourself as open to work um, and that will only be visible to headhunters it's not going to be visible to your current manager um, or, or your current colleagues um, you can actually indicate now, uh, this is quite a recent feature that was introduced off the back of last year, you can indicate more specifically what role uh, titles you're interested in and want to be contacted about. Um, you can also specify what geographies um, you want to hear about opportunities in um, if you're looking for things outside of London. Um, and then another quite useful tool to make yourself just come up in those searches is uh, adding the skills um, section at the bottom of your profile. Yes, you can describe each role with, with blocks of text, but it's just really useful to tag on the specific skills filters. So whether it's Python, whether it's financial modeling, whether it's project management or um, negotiation or whatever else, you want to just list those on there so that you come up. Um, yeah, I think those would be my, my key pointers there. Right. There's been a couple of questions come through on the chat about um, job gaps and career gaps within a CV and how the best way to what what's the best way to present that. Um, I guess yeah, the couple of uh, obviously there, there's a multitude of different reasons that you would have career gaps and particularly it's absolutely not uncommon at all that most of like a lot of the CVs that we have come through have had career gaps due to COVID and redundancy or they've left because the environment just uh, was too toxic to to cope with and you know it was much better for their mental well-being to, to actually just step away or you know there's uh maternity paternity you know there's the, there's a, a huge amount of reasons that you would have a career gap so it's not something to be embarrassed or ashamed of or have any kind of negative connotations at all and um, that's kind of the the first key thing i think if you are applying to jobs directly I would just put in the kind of dates and just say quite lightly kind of career gap 
you feel free to specify, um, but I don't necessarily think there's a need. But I guess just be be uh, cognizant of the fact that at interview you might be asked about it, and you can talk about it in a, a coherent um, and and positive way. It was something that has benefited you in the long run because you learned X, Y, and Z, and and you upskilled in in whatever area it was. Um, if you're working with a recruiter be very kind of honest and transparent about what the career gap was so that when we, uh, I mean, yeah, when we present profiles to clients, we can articulate that um, in, a, in a positive way. And therefore they know going into an interview with you, that's that's why. Um, so yes, I wouldn't worry too much about over explaining it on your CV, just have the dates and, and have a career gap. And, or if it was sabbatical, if it was travel, something that's easy to explain, but if it's something that's a bit more personal, don't feel like you have to put it on your CV and just explain when you're speaking to, um, you know, the first person you interview or or your recruitment firm, and they can, um, they can represent that in in the best way possible. Great. Um, I did see a question coming through about including personal information on your CV and whether that's required. Um, with um. I suppose information around your your gender, your ethnicity, um, maybe even including a photograph about yourself or, or listing your right to work. These things are not really reflective of your ability to do the job or not, so you don't have to include them on there. Um, with right to work, that is something that will most likely come up during the conversation about that specific role if if you go forward, just because it's a practical consideration and some companies will have the license and the ability to sponsor, whereas others will not. So that's, uh, again, it, it doesn't have any bearing on, on your ability to do the job, but it is a practical point that is important for, for companies to know. Um, as far as the rest of the, the information, you, you certainly don't need to to include that on your profile. Um, there is obviously a slight difference in terms of European TVs and, and TVs that we use in the UK. Uh, with European versions, you'll often see um, people including photos on them, but again, it, it, it really has no, no real relevance um, to your abilities as a candidate. So it's not required to include those types of um, information. Great, and then, um... Someone's asking about kind of confidentiality on, on CV and if you are perhaps coming from consultancy, obviously you've, you've worked in a variety of different kind of projects for, for clients and um, what's the right kind of etiquette for, for talking about that on your CV. Um, so I guess what we'd, what we'd say to that is that, um, you know, to Alex's earlier point about talk about the kind of broader aims of the project, what were you tasked to do? What did you, what skills did you have to utilize in order for, um, uh, for that project to be successful um, you know was it leadership was it organization was it um, agility and, and deliverables um, what was the actual end outcome of the project um, and how did that contribute to the success of, of the project overall um, so I think absolutely if you were if you were for example sorry um tasked uh, to work with coca-cola to help them innovate uh, and launch a new product you can say that you worked with a, a top um, consumer retail brand and talk through the different stages of that product launch from kind of market research, market sizing, market entry, running focus groups, and just kind of talk out those uh, those key elements that go into the deliverable. And then, yeah, when was the product launch? Was it successful? How is it doing 18 months on? And that kind of long term um, view on that. Um, so yeah, by, by no means, I would probably kind of veer away from, from mentioning client names directly unless um, your, your company has given you consent to do so, but you can certainly say kind of top retailer, top um, financial services firm or top five investment bank in the UK or something along those lines. Um, there's a question that's come in about uh, responding to an employer who asks you about salary expectations, but they don't disclose their salary. Um, that's a really good question. Um, and so I guess in this instance, you've not seen any uh, reference to salary on the job advert that you've gone through. Um, in that instance, I wouldn't necessarily rush to explain, you know, where you're at, where you want to be. I think as a general rule of thumb, most people want to move jobs with a kind of 10 or 15 percent increase on the base. Um, I think anything out above that, um, maybe, yeah, 10 is kind of a 10 percent is probably a, a good rule of thumb. When you kind of want a 20 percent uplift on your base salary, it can be... Um, 
a bit of a, a bit of a why there must be kind of a reason behind it. It doesn't often come around um, that you get as big an uplift. I think if you're working with a recruiter, they should um, they should and they can kind of ask your salary expectations. You've got absolutely no uh, reason to to withhold that from them. You're you're completely legally allowed to, um, but they are they're there to help you basically get the job. So as much as you can tell them, they won't disclose it to to your uh, the person that you're going for a job with. But they'll have a good understanding of kind of where you're at, where you want to be, and why that is the case. Um, but if you're kind of just going in straight into a job. Um, from from LinkedIn that you've applied for I would do some market research on the title of the job that you're going for try and kind of um you can look on Glassdoor if it's a large company they'll have the salary bandings for manager associate director there and that way you can kind of um get a bit of a view on the range um that is being paid in London for a sustainability manager and therefore you can kind of go in well equipped you've done your research you know what the the value is of, of this person and um, so I'd maybe use it from that viewpoint rather than oh well I'm on x amount this this much and this is why I want to be on you know y amount it's more just I know how much uh, an innovation manager gets paid and and therefore in a company of this size and that's why I think my salary expectations should be that. Um, but yeah, it should, it should hopefully the roles that you are applying for and, and certainly through kind of our job boards, we do post a range in mind to account for experience and ability, but also so that, yeah, no one's wasting anyone's time if it doesn't fit within expectations. But I don't know if you had anything to add on, on that one, Alex. No, I think, again, we're in quite a fortunate period of time. There's just so much information available um so platforms like glassdoor and other kind of similar websites exist where if you've not been given that indication initially you can do a bit of research around it you can just form your own view of what you're likely to be paid for that sort of role um, but i think the one thing that i would emphasize um, in terms of what Edith has said is when you're working with a headhunter you really want to kind of put them in a position where they are able to give you the help that you need in order to get the role that you want so withholding information around what you expect or you know maybe there are certain things that are prompting you to um, ask for a higher salary increase than that standard 10 to 15 percent but if we don't know what that reason is and, and what your thought process behind that is it would be very difficult for us to position it in the right way in the negotiation with the client so I think just bearing in mind that information that you pass in that relationship with the headhunter is going to be used in your best interest is really important so that you can really get the most out of that relationship. Great. And then there's one that's come through on um, on LinkedIn and asking if there's any kind of good alternative to LinkedIn. Um, I assume you mean kind of on, on looking for jobs, um, but please let, let us know if it, you mean something else. Because um, in terms of kind of networking tool, I'm not sure, uh, I, Alex might have a different view. I'm not sure any spring to mind, but in terms of kind of looking for job boards, I mean, Google for jobs is great. Um, Indeed sometimes can have some really good um, uh, good rules on there. Um, Read as well is a good platform. Um, I'm not sure, Alex, do you have any other ones that would be good kind of correlating in terms of searching for job titles? Yeah, so I think Indeed is a particularly good one just because it, it tends to be uh, used a bit more frequently than, than um, Read, for instance. Um, so I'd say LinkedIn and Indeed, although you're likely to see quite a bit of overlap between, between the two of them, I think generally speaking, LinkedIn is very much leading in terms of job boards currently, even though it's not um, a pure job board, it's still currently the, the most active platform to find opportunities, link up with professionals in the field that you're interested in. So um, that is still where we're seeing the most activity currently. Um, there are some slightly more niche ones, depending on whether you're looking at um, startups, for instance, but those tend to be geared towards those looking for very data science focused roles or programming, again, software development. So in terms of the roles that um, we most commonly work on, LinkedIn is, is still going to be the core platform. Great. Well, 
Thank you so much for taking the time this morning. Um, I really hope that that's been helpful content and can help you kind of give you some food for thought in terms of approaching your job search in 2022. Um, but yes, uh, we'll send around the recording of um, the webinar along with kind of a, an article which just kind of um, talks you through some of the, the recommendations and sources that, that we've discussed today. But um, really hope it's been helpful. And um, yeah, thank you very much and hopefully meet some of you soon. Bye. Bye-bye.